Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fergus Linehan. I am the festival director of the Edinburgh International Festival, and I am your chair for this afternoon's discussion. I'm delighted to be part of the Edinburgh International Culture Summit and this very special digital edition. I'm speaking to you from the top of the Royal Mile up by the castle in Edinburgh. Um, and I'm joined by uh, panelists from all over the world with very different backgrounds. We've got um, an extraordinary array of expertise um, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this discussion very much. Um, of course, this was the year, the first year since 1947 that the Edinburgh International Festival did not happen. Um, but interestingly, it was a festival that was born out of a time of darkness. It was a response to the end of the Second World War. Our founding director was um, a refugee, Rudolf Bing, who had fled from Austria and Germany and founded this festival. Um, and even though it is a gathering of the arts, it was very much a social, um, political um, project, which was designed to bring people back together again most famously with the Vienna Philharmonic being joined by Bruno Walter um, in an act of extraordinary reconciliation. So um, it feels apt that um, we're meeting at a time when our theatres and our cities have been silenced once again, um, not for the same sort of reasons, but still um, a, a moment where culture I think is going to play a role in reconciling, in healing, um, and informing connections that perhaps are going to be broken. Um, just to talk a little bit about our panelists, um, we are joined by Naris Pontilis, who is the Minister for Culture for the Republic of Latvia. Um, he was previously a member of Riga City Council. Um, I suppose particularly of interest to us today, he is a, a singer, a practicing artist and a politician and was um, headed up a they, um, a, a very famous band called Perkons in Latvia and sang at the Latvian National Opera. Um, even though it's a small country, Latvia has had an extraordinary range of artists perform at the festival, including people like Maris Janssens and Gideon Kramer. I could, I could continue to them an, an incredible, incredible output of, um, of musical life that has come from that country. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, Leo Pissar is the president of the Aladdin Project. I think you heard a little bit about that in the video we just heard. Um, also served on the staff of the National Security Council and the State Department and at the US Embassy in Paris. Um, Andy Haldane is chief economist for the Bank of England and a member of the Bank's Monetary Policy Commission. Um, he's also uh, authored four books and is a founder and trustee of Pro and Bono Economics, which is a charity that brokers economists into charitable projects. So as I say, we've got a, we've got a very interesting group. The, the theme for today is it's quite a big one. Um, it's that in, in a time of physical distance, how can art provide connection, inspire hope and help heal us? So I'm going to ask our panelists just for some opening thoughts. And I'd like to start, if I could, with Minister M. Puntulis. Um, as a, a practicing artist and as um, a, a, someone at the center of government, um, both personally as an artist, but also as, as, a, as a leader in government, how are the arts playing out? at the center of the discussion in, in government about COVID and about the recovery from COVID. Good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this uh, prominent uh, discussion on policy and culture. And I'm very happy to represent my country in this discussion as uh, one of the top officials of my country. <laughs> COVID-19 pandemija ir dēļ pieņem tiem mērķi līdz īsteno dopernām, teātru, koncertu organizāciju izrāšanu, koncertu programmas visā pasaulē. Daudz gaidīja tradicionāli notikumi šajā vasarā ir atcelti, arī pasaulē vērienīgākais Edinburgas starptautiskais festivāls. 
Un tomēr esmu gandrīz, ka festivāli ietvaros organizētājs Edinburga startotiskais kultūras samīts ir rādas iespējas savu programmu pārcelt digitālā formātā. This spring brought a lot of unexpected challenges to the culture sector. Unfortunately, we witnessed a lot of opera houses, theater houses, concert organizers and concert venues postponing and canceling the events due to lockdown and restrictions imposed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of popular regular events uh, that traditionally took place around the world, not only in Latvia, had to be cancelled, including Edinburgh International Festival. And that's why I'm doubly happy that the organizers of the festival have managed to find an opportunity to uh, hold International Culture Summit in a digital format. Bet jau laikā pasaulē ir satrisinājis ne tikai Covid pandēmiju, piemēram, nesanī notikumā SVs ilgi demonstrēja, ka mēs dzīvojam aizvien sašķeltākā pasaulē, pasaulē, kur aizvien biežāk cīti un viedokļi apmaiņā aizstāja neiecietību un ekstremismus, melnbauts pasaules skatījums. Globalizācijas laikmetā nerēt pilnībā pazot fokus uz mazo nāciju tiesībām pastāvēt kopas savas kultūras unikalitāti, kas mums Latvijā ir ļoti būtiski. Šādos laikos kultūra nevar dzīvot zīvoņkalam tornī un izlikties, ka apkārt noteikošais to neskat. Līdzīgi kā nu pat redzētajā filmā, pieminētajā gadījumā, ka 19. gadsimt nogals vāsu mākslinieki izvēlējās izvairīties no sociālu jautājumu atspaldījošanas. This year, COVID pandemic was not the only global challenge that we have uh, witnessed, for example, the recent events in the United States very clearly demonstrated that we are living in an ever more fragmented world, in a world where respectful dialogue and debate is quite often overpowered by intolerance and extremism, painting the world in black and white for small nations that have unique cultures such developments and events worldwide are very much concerning and we clearly understand and we have realized uh, that uh, the culture should not lock itself up in the ivory tower and pretend that whatever is happening around in the world is none of its uh, concern. And we just saw in a film uh, that was uh, screened before uh, the beginning of uh, the uh, summit uh, that uh, one of the uh, participants mentioned that uh, in late 19th, uh, 19th century German artists decided not to grapple with uh, great social issues of the time, which is uh, of course, one of the side effects. Ja kur cilvēki identitās pamatā ir vērtības sistēma, kas veido ietvaru cilvēku jāpilnē eksistencē. Protams, ik vienam cilvēkam ir raksturīgs vairākas identitātes. Nacionālā, lokālā, sociālā un tā tālāk, kas vien otru papildina, taču tās viss kopumā veic vienu funkciju veido piederības sajūtu. Cilvēks ir sociāla būtne, un ja kur cilvēki garīgai labklājībai ir būtisti, lai cilvēks justos piederības un pieņemts citu vidu. We as human beings, uh, we rely on a certain set of uh, values, values that get, give meaning to our life. Of course, all of us have several identities, if you will. We have national, local, and our social identity. All of them complement each other. However, all of them at the same time contribute to our sense of belonging. That is the common trait of all of these identities. Humans are social beings and our well-being to a large extent depends on our sense of belonging, whether we feel that we belong to this world and the society, and whether we are accepted by the others. Kuduri ir viens no iedarbīgākajiem līdzekļiem, ar ko piedarību un pieņemšanu var tikt atbalstīt. 
tā ir universāla valoda, kas ļauj būvēt tiltu starp cilvēkiem, uzrunājot cilvēku emocionālā līmenī, nevis skaidrojot pasauli racionālā valodā. Tā ir valoda, kas ļauj apiet šķietam nepārvaramos vaiņus, ko rada ašķirīgas reliģiskas, nacionālas vai sociālas piedarības. Tā ļauj runāt par vērtībām, kas ir universālas, atgādināt, ka vispirms mēs esam cilvēki un tikai pēc tam piedarīja kādai sociālai grupai. Culture is therefore one of the most powerful tools for promoting the sense of belonging and the acceptance by the others. It speaks universal language, building bridges between people. It appeals to us on an emotional level, instead of using probably rational terms to explain how the world uh, works. It uses the language that allows us to climb insurmountable walls created by different religions, different nationality and different social status. Ja, piemēram, COVID-19 pandēmijas laikā Itālijā notikušie balkona koncerti bija brīnišķīgs veids, kā iedzīvotājiem sajūst vienotību un kopīgi ticīt tam, ka arī šīs grūtības kādreiz beigsies. Un kā jau filmā tika minēts arī koncentrācijas nometnēs iestūtītie rakstīt dzēju un mūziku. No Latvijas uz Sibīrijas gulagiem izsūtītie organizēja kūras un teātra trupas, lai saglabātu cilvēcību necilvēcīgajos apstākļos. Bēgot no padomju okupācijas režīma, latvieši beigi nometnēs rietumos, smagos apstākļos arī paši organizējās, lai kopt un nacionālo kodolu, dzirdēja kūros un spēlē teātri. Culture allows us to speak about universal values and it reminds us that we are first and foremost human beings and only then belong to a particular nationality or religion. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Italy had these wonderful balcony concerts, which was a wonderful way to promote unity and give people, you know, strength to get over the difficult uh, times. And as was mentioned in the film that we just saw, prisoners of concentration camp, camps wrote poetry, wrote music. Similarly, Latvians who were deported to the Siberian gulags were uh, forming choirs, uh, theater companies, to preserve their humanity in those inhuman conditions. A lot of people who ended up in refugee camps tried to keep their culture together by joining choirs and joining theater companies. Thank you. Minister, if I could just, I'm sorry to jump in there. Um, I'm just conscious of, of time. Um, and we will have a time to come back to that. So if I could just ask you to just um, bring the remarks to a close and maybe we can join them again after I've had the other speakers have a moment to speak. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Just um, thank you very much, Minister. Um, just a couple of um, small points. If you are in the chat room, if you could introduce yourself to all of the attendees and not just the participants, that would be great. And if you have any questions, if you go into the Q&A section rather than the chat section, that would be great. Um, I just want to ask Leo Sar now. I mean, Leo, one of the things that I think is, is most interesting at the moment is the way in which this global conversation uh, seems to be an expansion of people's lives and an, and an enrichment of people's lives for some. But increasingly, we see that people see it as a, as a threat to their values and their way of life. Now, you're at the coalface of some of those particular um, issues. Why do you think that sort of division is becoming so pronounced at the moment? Well, we are living in a complicated and worrisome times. If you had asked me this six months ago, I would have had a lot to say. Now I have even more to say. Um, first of all, the unknown can be scary. If one doesn't know it, it can be strange. It can seem threatening, which is why our job must be to demystify it. But what is happening with COVID and with in tandem with COVID, the social unrest we're seeing is that um, people are scared. I find walking down the street in New York City, if someone walks toward me who is not wearing a mask, I feel that that person is now 
emitting some kind of a threat, wittingly or unwittingly. So we really each project a lot onto other people. And I think the most important thing we can do is uh, those of us who care about this is to try to demystify the other, to teach about the other, to get to know others, and to understand that we are all in this together. And that as all these new threats try to fragment us, the best way to push back is by being open to others. Um, I am speaking to you from the United States where we all woke up this morning to um, very bad and worrisome news of what happened in Wisconsin. There are protests happening everywhere. There is a Republican convention um, headed by the current head of state uh, that is really trying to fan the um, the flames of intolerance and of fragmentation. And we just cannot let this happen. This is happening in too many places in the world. And my hope, my feeling as the daughter of an Auschwitz survivor whose entire universe as that of everyone else on earth at the time was demolished by Hitler um, is that we can get past this and that together we can be stronger than uh, those who are trying to divide us. And again, this is done through open-mindedness and through trying to learn about others and work with others and develop our common humanity and our common culture and our individual culture and really through listening. My father taught me many important lessons and I think the one, the strongest one that stays with me is that there is no such thing as hereditary enemies. This was a very strong statement for someone who had been through everything he went through, who lost absolutely everything and everyone he had during the war, uh, who crawled his way out of a gas chamber. But if we can get past that, and if we can understand the importance of the humanity of others, um, we have a chance. And the other thing I would like to say is that this is to me um, something of a canary in a coal mine. When intolerance flares up, when suspicion flares up, when division and social unrest and in many cases violence flare up, this is a very unhealthy sign about our societies. So how do we combat this? I'm like a broken record. We, um, we have to encourage dialogue. We have to encourage people everywhere in the world, at the local level and at the international level to converse, to speak with one another, to trade, to listen, even if we don't agree with the other. You know, a lot of people are entitled to their opinions. We don't always agree with them. Uh, as an American, I certainly don't agree with uh, a lot of what's coming out of Washington now, but in order to understand, we must listen and we must try to dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Andy, um, I have something you once said, which was that the, the single driver of behaviors lies in the narratives embedded within ourselves. Um, is there a sense that the sort of connections that we're talking about, the sort of global connections, might have been seen to have helped some and not others? Um, and the sort of world, the, the connected world, has actually become somewhat threatening for some people. And we have some work to do with that, within that, that the idea that this neoliberal world has been great for people in culturally kind of sophisticated urban centers, but has left others behind. I mean, what, what has culture got to do with, with, with that connection with, with the wider conversation about globalism? Well, thank you. Fergus, let me start by uh, congratulating you and Jonathan and all the team for putting together a spectacular uh, festival. I've certainly hu uh, learned hugely 
uh, from it. I'm very happy to be a, a, a small part of it as a, as a lowly economist. In fact, um, as a lowly economist, I mean, a question I imagine a lot of you asking is, um, what could I possibly contribute to a discussion, a festival uh, of culture, given that economist stock in trade is typically uh, numbers, uh, concepts, like this funny thing, GDP, uh, and things that have a, a monetary value. Uh, I think my answer to that question, having reflected myself, is that uh, even economists need to take issues of culture, uh, issues of storytelling, uh, issues of feelings and emotions uh, fundamentally seriously, if they are to understand how both economies and uh, societies uh, function. And let me perhaps uh, illustrate that and, and speak to your question, Fergus, with uh, three quick reflections on, on social cohesion, which we had a lot about in the film, on stories, and then a bit about the future and those connections you mentioned. I mean, on the first of those, on issues of social connection, I mean, the film made clear and beautifully clear uh, the damage that can be done uh, if there is a lack of social cohesion, undermining the very foundations of society. Uh, and actually the self-same is true of economies, that um, those tears in the social fabric are as damaging uh, for our economies as they are for our societies. Our economy is after all no more and no less than a mirror image of the society in which it is uh, embedded. I mean, for example, if you look at the sort of history of the world economy, it's actually very simple to tell. So basically nothing much happened to growth in the economy till around the 18th century. And over the period since, uh, everything's taken off. You know, this, this funny thing called GDP has risen probably 20 fold over the last 250, 300 years. And the question is why? But we haven't become cleverer we haven't become more inventive. But what did happen back in the 18th century is we, we, we stumbled across, we began designing social institutions, some state institutions, uh, some civil society institutions, uh, some creative institutions, and often doing that on an international scale. And it's those social institutions that enabled social cohesion, greater social cohesion to be brought about. This thing called social capital was suddenly allowed to bloom. And that in turn provided the foundation stones for the growth in the economy, the economies that we've seen over the past several hundred years. And the self same has been true over the past several months. So um, during the coronavirus, you know, measures of the economy have collapsed, measures of finance have collapsed, but the social economy, social institutions have stood tall and kept societies together. They've served as, a, as they have in the past as the social glue. So those questions of culture, of social cohesion, if there is a secret source to economic success, those issues are as close as we'll have to get to such a secret source. And what's true of the past, of course, will be even more true of the future. Um, we know that in the past, the reason humans have been able to position themselves on the evolutionary superhighway is because of their imagination, their capacity for imagination, for storytelling about the future, and then crucially to set about creating that imagined future. That's what creativity is at uh, its core, and that's why the creative industries and culture matters so much as the fuel for those uh, imaginings. Now, um, now is a difficult time uh, to be having those imaginings, because we know again from past experience, whether it's Renaissance Italy or Enlightenment Scotland, that the wellspring of that creative process is the coming together of 
cultures, people from different backgrounds, from different parts of the world, from different cultures and different religions. That is the crucible of creativity. And right now, as Leah set out very compellingly, we see the forces both national and international uh, pulling apart and making it more difficult to create that coming together of people from different backgrounds, cultures and experiences. And for me, uh, that's why uh, events like this panel, like this festival, really are so fundamentally important when it comes to reimagining how this future will look, a future post COVID, a future post what is sometimes called the fourth industrial revolution, a future that leans more heavily even in the past against these forces of social disconnection that we saw set out so beautifully in the film and which both the previous speakers have set out so clearly as well. Focus, let me stop there. Right, thanks so much. Um, yes, I think it's, it's, it's been commented upon that for those who thought some kind of social dystopia was going to rain down on top of us, that actually communities have really bound together through this in, in, in quite a strong way. Um, I am gonna ask um, for some questions. I think there are some people who are going to join us. Um, I'm just going to ask, I know that um, Alison Turnbull from Historic Environment Scotland had a question. Is Alison there? I am here. Um, so it's very important that play with this issue. Uh, sorry, Alison, we're having some, we're having some oh, trouble. Can you hear me? It's okay. We're having a little trouble with sound. Can, can we, I wonder, could we just come back to you in a minute. Um, we'll just go to, uh, is Cynthia Schneider? Oh, is my sound on now? No, your sound is on, is on slow, actually. So, um, um, Cynthia's not here yet. Um, let's, we just, Alison, do you want to just, just kind of give that another go and we'll just see if it's working again. I am um, here. For Oh, hi, Cynthia. Cynthia, sorry. Sorry, Alison, if okay. you could just, if we could give you a moment. Cynthia Schneider, professor in the practice of diplomacy from Georgetown University. How are you? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for including me, Fergus. I want to add my other, uh, one of my other hats, which is as co-director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown and my other co-director, Derek Goldman, sends his greetings, but is unable to be here. You can't see him though, and the fantastic actor, David Strathairn, in the beautiful film, thank you, Jonathan and team, done by the festival. Just look under any of our names uh, in under contributors. It relates very much to what Leah was talking about so beautifully. It's uh, a film about our production uh, of uh, about Jan Karski, someone very important for these days because he was a truth teller. He was a Holocaust witness. But I want to um, move the conversation a little bit more in the direction of uh, social cohesion and uh, take you to a place that strangely no one has mentioned yet on this panel, I don't quite know why, and um, that is Timbuktu. Because that's where I heard social cohesion talked about a lot. Uh, and I heard it in particular from the Imam, he now retired, but a few years ago, the Imam uh, in a uh, head Imam in Timbuktu. And he said to me and my Malian colleagues in the Timbuktu Renaissance, he said, you have to proceed with your goal of organizing live concerts again in Timbuktu because what we need to recover social cohesion after the occupation by extremists is live music. Now that, you know, I tried that out a few times in the State Department and it, it doesn't go over that well. They look at me very confused. But what he was talking about was this, a topic that some of you have touched on, the idea of emotional appeal 
and the ideal, uh, the idea of identity. In Mali, it's music. It might be something else somewhere else. It might be literature. It might be uh, live theater works particularly well in Pakistan and Cambodia, it's dance. But in Mali, it's music. And that's really how people communicate. Uh, and the musicians are the ones who carry, they're the canaries in the coal mine, Aaliyah, who carry the messages from the people to the politicians. And so bringing people together as, as we've actually done in Timbuktu right up to the COVID, bringing people together for live concerts actually, and, and people said this to me, enabled them to borrow something you said, Andy, to reimagine the future because they could look around and see all of the town who they hadn't seen, everybody had been scared to come out, everybody had been in their houses, in their own small groups, to see everyone, to enjoy something they all enjoyed together, to dance together, and basically everyone was humanized again. And when violence flared up again, the mayor actually asked us to organize another concert specifically bringing different groups together. Now, you may have noticed Mali is uh, undergoing political change. There's been a coup, the president has resigned uh, and people are at work, not just the Timbuktu Renaissance, various people are at work organizing concerts for their national day, September 22nd, because that is what will help bring people together Literally, we're planning to pair musicians from the south with musicians to the, from the north, literally showing uh, what social cohesion unity is and giving people the opportunity to actually experience it emotionally. So I just wanted to put a plug in and ask people about this active role of culture. And, and we've seen it also with our productions at the lab, whether it's the Karski production or production we did with the Pakistani theater company, that these the action of culture can really change people's minds and change how they think about a situation. So I just, I think that's so important. I'm just going to mention something that was in the film and, and you know, poor Andrew's not here to defend himself. But whether or not Karadich, a war criminal like Mozart, is just completely irrelevant and it's not Mozart's fault. Uh, so um, what, what matters is what people experience. And of course, that's more challenging now when we can't be together. Um, I'm sorry, it may sound bad what we're doing in Mali, but they're all in the streets anyway, so they might as well go to a concert. Uh, but we will be able to experience it together again. And what, of course, Jonathan, everyone is doing to give us a chance to do it online now matters a lot and we can bring many more people from around the world. Uh, but anyway, I'm curious what people think about the action of culture and what it can do. Right, so yeah, if anyone just had any thoughts, I mean, is this specifically about, about what actions we want to take? Um, and obviously some of us are actual presenters and obviously we have a Minister for Culture here, but, but what, what, what actions do we think um, we, we might need to take to just counter everything that's going on at the moment? Um, can I just give a, uh, a, a quick response? Cynthia, of course, uh, I think everybody here agrees with you that um, these events are essential. We're just at a very strange time right now, which is that we can't really fathom going to concerts or uh, being outside and we're locked into this virtual universe that I think is making a lot of us feel perhaps claustrophobic um, and most of all frustrated. So it's, it's kind of a it's almost a difficult time to project, imagine, and fantasize about what it would be like to be at concerts, to be at theater. But um, two things, we must look toward that and work toward that. And the other thing we must do is support the artists and the performers who are suffering so much now because so many of their contracts have been canceled or are in jeopardy. So I would say, uh, let's really shine the light on that and talk about what we can do with this double necessity, one of 
using and enjoying cultural events as a way to grow closer, but also the vital importance of supporting the artistic community that is really struggling as a result of this pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder, um, might I just bring in if, I'm not sure, Alison, if, if your microphone is working again, um, might just see if, if, if you could come in there. This is Alison Turnbull from Stark Environment Scotland. Oh uh, dear. <laughs> Sorry, Alison, we'll, we'll try again. We'll try again a little later. Um, I might just double back to that question of, of the action of culture. I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Puntillas, could you just let us know from a government point of view, what actions your government are, how are they responding in relation to culture with the current crisis? Do you think it's going to change cultural policy? Do you think there's a different need now for culture than there was before the crisis? Yeah, for this period of time. Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting question. Well, first of all, what we do have to understand is that nobody can predict right now how long this crisis will last. And there are two ways in which our government is responding to current crisis. As a government, as a state, we are offering uh, everyone in the creative industry a kind of benefit, a subsistence that they need to survive this tough period. Un otra kārt, mēs tomēr ņemot vērā ierobežojumus, ka uzliet pandēmiju, nodrošinām šos radoš, šīs radošās personas ar darbu. Protams, mēs nemināk par koncertiem un, un izrādēm un kultūras pasākumiem lielā apjomā, bet tik lielā, lai katrs mākslinieks varētu uzturēt savu profesionālo kvalifikāciju un būt tik ļoti svarīgo kontaktu ar auditoriju, kas ir kuram mākslinieks ļoti svarīgi. And also, given the restrictions, we are, of course, you know, abiding by all the restrictions that we have put in place, but we are trying to nevertheless give our culture industry as much job as possible. We are not talking about mass events or uh, big, you know, theatre plays or concerts. Those you know, gatherings have to be restricted to a smaller number of participants or audience, smaller audiences. Nevertheless, this is a way for to enable artists to, to keep practicing and to uh, let them meet their audiences so that they don't somehow lose their skills during this you know lockdown and restrictions es kā mākslinieks pats saprot cik svarīgi ja kuram mākslinikam ir nepodēt šīs profesionālās iemaiņas i as an artist know very well that you need to you know practice and give performances you know to keep your professional standards as high as possible. And I, as an artist, know and appreciate the eye contact. Even if you have, you know, just a couple of people listening to you, an eye contact, a, a contact with the audience is very important. Un es ļoti labi saprotu arī, ka jebkurš mākslinieks sagaidšanīgi grūtajā laikā atbalst no valsts. And I very much empathize with artists who expect the government to help and support them in these difficult times. And that is how we try to help our culture industry survive. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, Alison has actually typed in her question. So, um, Alison Turnbull. Um, from Historic Environment Scotland, and her question is that uh, as, as well-known culture has a key role to play in reimagining, oh, I'm sorry, um, basically, sorry, as we well know, culture has a key role to play in reimagining, particularly in this post-COVID world, how can we change our narrative to influence sectors who are not as familiar with its benefits? Um, this is certainly a big question that's going around at the moment, which is not just how do we get back to normal, 
but also um, how is this an opportunity to address things in culture that are either systematically flawed, whether it's around elitism or social justice. But I think there's a lot of conversation at the moment about um, ways in which culture and society might need to change. Um, Andy, I'm interested in terms of, is this, is this a conversation that's just in culture, but there's certainly a conversation going around at the moment, which is it's not a question of getting back. It's a question for a moment of reinvention. Is, is that just us? No, I think that's pretty universal, Fergus, uh, and, and welcome, I'd say, as well. I mean, unsurprising, uh, given where we've, uh, where we've reached, but um, in the specific context of, of culture, the creative uh, industries, I think what that usefully uh, shines a light on is um, how do we think about the contribution that a set of activities or indeed a sector makes to us as a society. Now for, you know, for nerdy economists like me, we tend to keep score, as I mentioned earlier on, using numbers uh, and often using financial numbers, monetary numbers. What is the contribution a sector makes to the amount of income uh, that an economy uh, generates? And that's not a terrible way of beginning, beginning a conversation about the role of culture and the role of the creative industries. For what it's worth, you know, in the UK, that has the creative industries scoring pretty highly, you know, contributing perhaps a uh, hundred billion pounds sterling, about 5% of the economy, uh, to, uh, to growth, to, 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 the, uh, to the economic growth in the economy. But we also know from lots and lots of studies over lots and lots of years, that that's an enormous underestimate of how much society itself values cultural and creative activities of various types. The, the benefits, the happiness benefits, the well-being benefits from those cultural activities are many multiples of the monetary values that I just mentioned. And perhaps now in the light of COVID, um, it's as good a time as any to rethink about how we as economists, how we as society keep score on success, perhaps looking beyond those monetary values towards more subjective ways of keeping score in terms of the degree of optimism or well being or the avoidance of anxiety. Uh, or homelessness, or pessimism, you know, those, that, that more general way of keeping score, I think if we were to move to that, as some economies across the world have started to think about doing, that I think would shine a different light on the cultural sector, on the creative industries, and most likely a much more favourable light in terms of what they offer to all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, again, bringing this back to the sort of the questions around, particularly around social cohesion. Um, and Lee, obviously you're, you're in the US at the moment where, you know, the, the questions around social cohesion are very, very pointed. Um, and I guess some of, these, some of these questions around social equity, which are really starting to burn in a way that we, we haven't seen them before and we're being asked to consider things in a way we never have before. Um, I mean, with, with the particulars and obviously around the, the, the Black Lives Matters protests that have happened over the summer, um, where do we think that, you know, in particular culture's role is just in, in terms of, of, of addressing this or, or where does it sit in your mind? I mean, obviously you're, you're at, a, at, a, at a critical moment in history in the US. I have to say that at this moment in the US, culture's role is somewhat aspirational because we are dealing with um, an unhappy, a very unhappy period um, in the political sphere, which is reverberating into all parts of society, uh, compounded by the COVID crisis and the social unrest, which is of course not unlinked to the COVID crisis, but is mostly fomented by the uh, current 
political leadership. So it's a tough question to answer because everything right now is tainted by what is happening politically, by the fact that we're on the eve of an election that is going to be very, very contentious to say the least. And all we can do is be hopeful that things will calm down eventually. Um, I say this uh, in full display of my political preferences, but that things will change in the wake of the November election, whose results we certainly won't know um, on election night. And uh, I really feel that the United States and many countries in the world are at a crossroads and it is a political crossroads. And it is for citizens who have the right to vote, which is a very, very precious right to um, try and steer things. Uh, we can either go the wrong way or we can go back to a world um, where there is some democracy, where there is some aspiration toward equity, not perfect, but at least aspiring to, um, to uh, a better national and international environment. And a lot really rests upon that. The cultural element is essential, but right now the political one is really dictating a great deal. But I guess what I would just to, to uh, wrap up this uh, slightly um, incoherent and, uh, and uh, complex thought, there are different elements at play. There is the political, there is certainly the economic and the cultural. And the question is how they all come together and can we still find our way back onto a hopeful path and as a um, somewhat of an irrepressible optimist, I believe that we can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just as a couple of questions here um, on the board from, um, some of, there's the one here from Colin McGivern from the British Council. Um, in your experience, what are the best ways to strengthen people to people connections through culture, particularly where language may be a barrier? So um, I'm just wondering, perhaps um, Minister Buntulis, just in relation to the, the, the parts of culture that really make those connections, um, and, and, and particularly in relation to asking about, about language and where language, overcoming the barrier of language in terms of cultural connection? Yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. I actually, before the uh, summit, I attended a ceremony which marked 10 years of service of the Archbishop of Roman Catholic Church um, here in Latvia. And as you probably know, we are not sort of purely Catholic country. And, you know, this was a sort of an ecumenical event. Representatives of different religions came together to celebrate 10 years of service at the Archbishop. Uh, uh, and, you know, it was a spectacular event. And it was an event which brought people together people of different backgrounds, including religious backgrounds, of course. And everyone praised him for being a Pole of a Polish background, and at the same time, being able to combine it with his Latvian identity and being able to nurture his Latvian identity alongside his Polish roots. Uh, 
attaisos arhibiskap salīdzināt ar kaut ko, kā viņi salīdzināja ar, ar inovatīvu kompasu, ar tiltu, ar daudz ko citu. And in my speech, I, in fact, you know, refused to compare him to anything because, you know, there were people who compared him to an, an innovative compass uh, or a bridge. Un es teicu, ka es būtu gandarīgs, ja sabiedrībā būtu vairāk tādu, kuras mēs esmu mēģinātu salīdzināt ar viņu. Instead, uh, what I said in my congratulatory speech was that, you know, we should have more people like him, you know, who embody these qualities, this ability to, you know, merge different backgrounds and identities. Ar to es gribēju pateikt, cik ļoti šī situācijā ir svarīgi līderi. And I just wanted to underline by this how important a leadership can be. Vienu. You know, in terms of uniting and bringing people together. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think certainly, you know, I'm, I'm Irish and I came to live in Scotland and when I landed, there was the independence referendum here, quickly followed a few years later by the Brexit referendum. And so the idea of, of being able to be Scottish and British and European and global has been a, a recurring um, kind of political discussion. Um, but I think you bring up an important point there in terms of political leadership in this. Um, and and the, the people have taken their leads a lot from what has been said by their political leadership. And it's, um, it, it brings up areas of complexity that perhaps are difficult for politicians to be able to, to deal with at times. And um, there's a specific question here for you. Um, um, just looking for here. Sorry, um, it's for you, Andy. I'm afraid. I'm afraid it's a it's a big one. Um, <laughs> it's the pandemic has been harder for poorer populations, especially minority social groups in countries um, like the UK and the US. It's highlighted the big gap that prevents true social cohesion. What role do you think central banks across the world can play to reduce this gap in the recovery phase? Uh, thanks, Fergus. That is a, a big question. I'll not attempt too big an answer, but um, I mean, the, the premise of the question is absolutely uh, right, that many of the, the yawning uh, social and economic and financial disparities that, that, um, that, that predated the COVID crisis be they um, in levels of income or levels uh, of wealth uh, or in levels of uh, poverty or uh, homelessness uh, or anxiety, uh, they have all, if anything, been made worse. Their spot lines have been widened uh, by the events of the past uh, six, to, uh, six to nine months. And what was a priority in terms of closing those fault lines pre-COVID has now for me very much become a societal uh, necessity. Uh, now when it does come to you know, what policy, what policy makers like me can do, um, at least as far as central banks are concerned, the answer is uh, relatively modest amounts, uh, I'm afraid. And that's because the, the things that we control, such as the level of interest rates uh, in the economy, kind of borrowing costs, if you like, uh, we can't set different borrowing costs for different segments or cohorts of society. You know, me at the Bank of England, I can't set a different interest rate for you know, poorer people uh, in the northeast of England, which is where I was born, to those in the southeast of England, uh, where I now live, and where the level of income is somewhat higher. That's not, it's not something that's technically possible. So ultimately, uh, the burden of that uh, will need to fall, I think, uh, on governments. They have the capacity to move monies around between different cohorts of society, be that different age groups or different income levels or different uh, regions uh, of a nation state. We've seen some of that happening already on a global scale. We've seen governments globally provide unprecedented in peacetime amounts of support to jobs and support to incomes and that's tended to focus on those that are most vulnerable 
and those that are poorest, but I don't doubt uh, that more of that will be needed at a global level uh, in the years ahead if those pre-existing fault lines widened by the COVID crisis are not to uh, re-emerge and cause fractures uh, in the foundations of our society and economy. So uh, less for central banks than for governments, but yes, much more will be needed. Uh, in a way, and this is the, um, I wouldn't describe myself as the irrepressible optimist that Leah did, um, but I think, you know, COVID might usefully uh, be the factor that causes those pre-existing issues uh, to be focused on to an even greater extent. So my hope would be that might be the catalyst for change in tackling what in many cases, as I say, are generational problems uh, of social inequity. There's actually there's, there's an interesting question here from William Sterling from the Trojan Women's Project, because he says the um, uh, does the panel believe that culture should be centrifugal or centripetal in its outlook? Um, is it the aim of cultural expression without limit or is its aim moral? Um, just get into the central frugal or petal in terms of just whether or not, you know, we're talking about a central bank there, but whether or not we need to rethink culture as coming from institutions such as ours and coming from big capitals. Um, and if we really do want to talk about social cohesion, um, do we need to reverse that somewhere? Lee, I'm going, to, I'm going to look at you on this one in terms of because you're not coming from just a big cultural institution. Um, so what do you feel about that? Do you think that the, do you think we are kind of too top heavy? Do you think culture is, needs to rethink itself in terms of which, which when we're looking at social cohesion, which, which models do you think work? First of all, those are some mighty big words. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that, uh, I'm not sure we can control that because culture comes from so many places. Uh, it comes from whoever creates and whoever absorbs. And of course, um, you know, I myself am the, uh, the product. My life has been a tale of two cultures. I was born and raised in France of American parents. So the, uh, the government model of how to um, deal with culture is, is very different in the United States and in France. But I think um, in an ideal world, culture would really emanate from all levels. It would be encouraged from the top, from the state, from private institutions. And all of this would conspire to help individuals have access to greater cultural expression because to um, to come in for a, uh, a conclusion of this uh, of this discussion um, it's a very important force and it's one that everybody can relate to absolutely every human being in the world can in some way relate to some aspect of culture be it music theater dance, cinema, architecture um, in, in, in many ways. Um, and I feel as someone who works with an NGO that there is a great deal we can do and that we do through culture and education. And we do it by working with, um, with governments, with local authorities and with institutions to bring young people together. So we have a summer university that meets every year, it did not meet this year, of course. And um, last June, we did a big um, uh, conference in Berlin, a youth summit to discuss what we can do about social cohesion. The point of this, the, 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 the pragmatic point is by bringing young people together and by bringing people together from different vantage points and different backgrounds is where we can really create a constructive dialogue. And I hope, and Andy, you're not as much of a pessimist as you are insinuating. Um, I hope that this, this unfortunate period that we are um, experiencing now can be a real time for reflection 
and for us to all be thinking about what we're going to do when the curtain comes back up and we can get back out there. And I would urge everybody to um, get back out there and really mix it up and talk to others and open your minds even more to others. And hey, even now, listen to music that's not what you would normally listen to. And take this time to watch movies that are maybe not what you would usually watch and learn about the other because this will be very, very useful going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I agree. I think it is an amazing time. We talk at the festival a lot about how we have always got another festival coming at us like a train and, and where do you ever find the time to, to really consider things. I think that one of the other kind of resets is that I think the culture for many people, many cities has become a kind of branding exercise and has become about whether it's in relation to just the identity of a city or in relation to um, urban regeneration. And that <clears throat> there's an argument that perhaps it has been constructed in a way which was not actually built for the people of the place. Um, and that we do need to have a look at that. Um, and I think that's particularly coming out of the back of the 2008 recession where culture really had to justify itself in, in the harshest of, of economic terms. But the things we're missing now, even though obviously the economic benefits are missed, there's, there's so many people just missing the kind of the, the questions of, of health and well-being. Um, I think that we might just start to um, wind it up there. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any conclusions and just to ask the panelists just to draw, draw together just a few thoughts there. Um, just in conclusion, Minister um, Puntulis, would you like to just um, add anything to the discussion as, as, we, as we tie things up? Yeah, it's not that like shows positive thoughts. Yes, I would like to conclude on a more positive note. Es pieder pie tiem optimistiem, kuri uzskata, ka šī Covid ietekme uz kultūras patēriņu iespaidu ilgtermiņā neatstās. I belong to a group of optimists who will think that there's who think that there's not going to be a lasting impact of the corona virus on the culture. Un ja atstās, tad tikai pozitīvi. And even if there's going to be any impact, it's going to be only a positive one. So, and my motto as a Minister for Culture is Culture sector must emerge from this crisis stronger, not weaker. Un valstī ir jānodrošina, lai krīzes laikā šis sektors varētu darīt to, ko viņi, protams, labāk, doti radīt. And the government must ensure that during the crisis, the sector can do what it does best, create. Paldies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy, have you any final words for us? Um, maybe just a couple. Fergus, thank you. Um, with the first one, and going back to the, the theme of optimism, which I'm warming to, despite being a purveyor of the dismal of economics, I'm, um, I've, I've been especially uplifted by uh, this experience and, 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 and the whole festival to, um, to think that that really does hold, um, uh, really does hold the, the key um, when coming through this crisis and when tackling, as I say, some of those uh, long-standing uh, social fault lines that we all know about only to um, or know about only to uh, too well. So um, you know, for me, uh, an underemphasized theme or underemphasized uh, element of the importance of cultural activities is its capacity to take us outside of our own experience, which for any people at the moment is relatively uh, gloomy. Um, to conceive of that reimagined uh, world or reimagined uh, society, which we all desperately uh, need right now. And as importantly then to set about creating, uh, set about creating it. So, I mean, uh, to, that, to that end, 
Um, I think back to when this festival started, Fergus, you mentioned at the very beginning, back in 1947, I think you said. Uh, I mean, at the same time, a set of global institutions uh, were being put in place uh, to secure a degree of uh, longevity and continuity for issues around uh, human rights, for issues around the global monetary order, and for issues around uh, global uh, poverty. Those institutions, those international institutions have stood the test of time. They've been able to bring together different cultures, different experiences in securing a much greater uh, degree of international monetary order, of reduction in poverty and improvement in human rights over that period. Perhaps, perhaps we need in our reimagining of the future to conceive of something similar at an international level when it comes to issues uh, of culture and issues uh, of creativity. There's a thought for the future, uh, one I'll leave uh, you and the others on this call with. Thank you. Great, Leah. We're going to, of the panelists, we're going to leave the last word to you before we head to Jonathan. Well, I think my job is done because uh, there, there's, there's optimism coming from uh, all of our participants. And uh, Mr. Minister, I agree with you. I'm hopeful that there will not be lasting negative consequences of this um, terrible, terrible period that we are going through. Um, and that is, I think, much worse for many people throughout the world than it is for the people on this panel or who have the luxury to sit in front of a computer and um, watch this right now. And so maybe, just maybe, if everyone does their part, things can continue to improve and to quote President Obama, who uh, liked to cite Martin Luther King, who still likes to cite him, um, the arc of history eventually bends in the right direction. Thank you, Fergus. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for your optimism, and thank you for us all restating our vows in relation to building bridges through culture. Um, at this point, I'm going to hopefully bring in Jonathan Mills, um, uh, who will hopefully set, wrap things up for us. Jonathan, are you there? Yes, I am. Fergus, first of all, thank you for so artfully um, convening an almost impossible um, conversation. We could go on for another two or three hours about this and really only scratch the surface. But Fergus, thank you. And thank you also for the wonderful contribution to the digital edition that the Festival Chorus have made, really uplifting us. If you want to see something truly optimistic, go and see these people bursting out of their homes and bursting into song with the wonderful verses of, Car uh, of the songs of Karl Orff. Um, uh, Nauris Puntilis, um, Minister from Latvia, um, Andy Haldane, Leah Pizar, thank you for your contributions um, in, um, in trying to um, uh, explore this topic. Yesterday, Gustavo Dudamel reminded us that music is a fundamental human right. We can, of course, add dance, drama, poetry, painting, cinema, sculpture to those fundamental human rights. And in, and, and in asserting that, I think we need to pay particular attention and particular tribute to the incredible contributions on the film that preceded this discussion, and particularly to two Syrian people of Syrian origin now living in Glasgow, Sanaa and Essam, um, who work with Charlotte Egar and William Sterling in the Trojan Women Project in Glasgow. See, see the full film on, on, on our website, but let's, let's understand why we are doing this. What is this about? This is about human dignity and how dignified, how extraordinarily positive were those people who have come through an incredibly difficult situation and, and indeed have their, their optimism, their humor um, and their love intact. I also would recommend, again, bring to your attention the, an incredible film, very much around the, 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 the 
the theme of culture and social cohesion made by the great um, Hollywood actor, David Strathairn. Um, remember this, the lesson of Jan Karski, um, the Polish freedom fighter who brought the Holocaust to the attention of the deaf ears of politicians two generations ago. But actually David's rendition of, of that play on the porch of a friend in upstate New York without lights and cameras and, and makeup shows that actually all you need is your voice and an idea to, cut, to, to inspire the world. There are many things that I would hope you will explore on the special edition program and, and on the special edition platform. Thank you all for your contributions. Um, and uh, let's hope that we can indeed meet um, in 2022 at the Scottish Parliament and give each other a lot of love and a lot of uh, a warm embrace.